Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Hear me at the back? <laughs> all right, let's get started. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Og. Thank you very much to the uh, organizers of AppSec Israel, uh, not just for organizing this great conference, but uh, also for deciding that all the talks should be in English. That's making my life a lot easier today. So that's great stuff. I'll give it a try. <laughs> okay. So. So, before the, uh, before the talk, I had a look at the list of attendees that we put up on the shared site. See the breakdown based on job title, breakers, builders, defenders. Came down to about 50% builders, 30% defenders, 20% breakers. So don't, don't look at that, that's not useful, that's a joke. But that's really good. I was, I was pleased with a good percentage of builders, good percentage of defenders, because that's really the talk's aimed at today. Um, the idea of this talk came a couple of years back when worked on an application security test. Now, in this test, it wasn't a regular test. We started off, we sat down with the developers, we understood, okay, what is this application? How does it work? Where, what, how do different modules link together? How does everything fit in? Where are the security controls? We really understood that in depth from them. Once we'd done that, we had various ideas of, okay, security improvements. We then started the actual hands-on testing. And by this time, we understood the application a lot better. We understood a lot uh, what was going on behind the scenes. We even had server level access to the web server so we could go in, look at logs, look at codes. It really was a much more informed test. We had a much better idea of what we were doing. And that got me thinking, you know, why can't every test be like that? Why can't we do more wide scale tests like that, more in depth, more uh, thoughtful tests? So initially I thought, okay, let's aim this talk at attackers, at breakers, at people who day jobs like mine, going in, testing applications. But it occurred to me that if you're a pen tester, if you're an application security tester, then odds are there are lots of resources available telling you how to do this, how to do a job better, how to do a wider scope, how to use more thoughts. But, you know, lots of examples here, including the one that gave me the, the inspiration for the name of this talk. But if you're a defender, if you're a builder, there aren't those resources available. There isn't that information freely available. How to get more out of the process, and that's what I wanted to try and achieve with this. So, quick background about me, uh, in case you missed the beginning, my name is Josh Grossman. Uh, I've worked for the last 10 years, IT risk, IT security, uh, also a bit of software development. Uh, currently working as a team leader in the application security division at Comsec. Um, also do a little bit of cloud on the side. Um, I'm married with two kids living in Modian. So it's important to say, um, I deliberately put this on a non-branded uh, slides. These are my personal opinions. I'm not a spokesman for Comsec. This isn't an advert for Comsec. Um, this is the talk about ideas. I didn't want some branding to distract from that. Having said that, obviously, Comsec's where I've got a lot of experience that's given me these ideas, and that's obviously a, been a big benefit. I just wanted to note that up front. So what do you want to do today? Ideally, there's something for everyone here. If you're a builder or defender, hopefully some of the ideas that I talk about today will be new to you, some of them will be relevant to you, some of them you can take home and use, take it home and take it back to the office and use. If you're a breaker, I suppose the main question is, are you ready to deliver tests with this level of quality, this level of uh, thought? Uh, if you've got any questions, <laughs> save them to the end. Um, don't forget to that stage because I'm a little bit pressed for time, but come and talk to me afterwards. I'll put my contact details up at the end of the talk. So, the way I see it, you're doing application security testing already. If you're a big company, then you've got regulations that say you have to do this. Maybe you're subject to PCI, maybe you're subject to banking regulations. They say you have to do application security testing. If you're a small company, you've got customers who say, okay, here's our list of security requirements from your product, from your service. One of the items on that list is going to be, do you do security testing of your application with your systems? So this is something you're already doing. Hopefully, even if you weren't required to do it, you do it anyway. Um, so if you're already doing it, let's try and do it with the best possible value. Let's try and do it with as much value, as much uh, quality as possible. It's worth doing, it's worth doing right. Uh, I had a client few years back now, and they were very, very aggressive about fees. They didn't want to pay consultant fees. They always wanted the lowest possible rates. And we ended up doing some work for them. 
And as part of the work, we had to review various documents, various reports they'd received, and we saw a security report prepared for them by a different consultant. And this report was in English, and it was diabolical. It was a really upsetting report to look at. It was clear they'd gone for the lowest possible bid, the lowest possible option, and you could tell by the quality. And that sort of takes us on to the, the next step, the next, I suppose, underlying principle here. You're going to get out what you get in. If you put good meat into the sausage, you're going to get good quality sausage. If you put the effort in, if you put uh, the, the time into making sure that the test delivers more, more value, you're going to get that uh, extra quality test at the end. And as well as that, often every test is going to be based on here's the period of time, here's the number of hours you have to do this test. And you want to get the most value out of those hours as you possibly can. And make sure that your tests are spending in the best possible way. Another thing to bear in mind is that not every test is the same, not every company is the same, not every situation is the same. That goes for the test itself, and make sure the test is customised to the particular situation. It also goes for this talk, because some of the ideas in the hill will be relevant to some companies, some will be relevant to other companies, some of them will be relevant to specific applications. But hopefully, like I said, something in here for everyone. So when can we do this? Where can we do this in the process? So I'm going to talk about three opportunities, three times we can, three parts of the process where we can start to think about these ideas. The scoping stage, when we're talking about, okay, what are we going to test? How are we going to test it? Who's going to do the testing? What's going to be included? At the preparation stage, okay, so now we know there's going to be a test. We've signed all the documents. We're now just waiting in the run-up to deliver the test. And the reporting stage. That goes for reporting during the test. That goes for the report that comes out of the test. That goes for the processes after the test finishes. So these are three opportunities, five ideas for each opportunity. Let's dig in. So the first point, okay, this is a little bit 101, I guess, in that you've said it lots and lots of times. You want to do security as early as possible. If you're still at the early stages of the development process, you're still at the design stage, still at the architecture stage, you want to start thinking about it right then because anything you can cover off then will reduce the number of things, the number of findings, the number of issues you come across when you get to the testing stage. We had a big client, very, very high profile application, very tight time scales. They brought us in to do the security testing. We were sat in a war room together with uh, us, the developers, the QA teams, the designers, the architects, the project managers. Everyone sat together trying to get this application signed off. And there were a lot of findings. There were a lot of issues we came across in terms of security issues. And there was a lot of, a lot of back and forth between us and the developers saying, okay, we need to fix this, we need to fix this, we need to fix this. And at one point, a developer came up to me in frustration and said, you know, why didn't you tell us this before? Why didn't this come up before? And I, I couldn't say to him, but ultimately the reason was because we'd only been brought in at the testing stage. We'd been brought in at the design stage when the key decisions were made. Then a lot of these issues might have been covered off then, and then wouldn't have been left to the testing stage when suddenly we're having to find and report all these issues at this such a late stage. Um, so, yeah, pushing it to the left. So the whitest white box, or more likely the most transparent box, the client came to us and said, okay, we want you to test this little marketing site we stood up. We had a look, it was a WordPress site. So it asked us for a quote, so we said, okay, I can do this in two ways. We can do this black box, we can just throw all the normal testing against it at the site, we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes except that it's WordPress, and we'll see what happens, and that'll take X time. Or we can do this white box. You give us the credentials to your WordPress install, we'll go in, we'll look at the configuration, we'll look at the customizations you've done, we'll look at the plugins you're using. We can then target ourselves, we can then focus on the specific high risk areas, and that'll take you 75% of X. It'll take less time because we'd be more focused. And they came back and said, yeah, we'll take the black box test. We don't want to mess around with the credentials or the white box or anything. And that's very much not what we're looking for, very much not what we're striving for. We want as much information as possible. I think there's a occasionally a misconception that we're looking for a realistic test. We want to realistically simulate an attack. If you want a realistic attack, then insult Kim Jong-un from North Korea and you'll get a realistic attack. But that's not what we're going for here. What we want is value. We want to get value out of the process. We want to get benefit from the process, the most benefit possible. That means the most coverage of that application, the highest quality testing, and the shortest time possible. We had a client who gave us read-only access to their GitHub repository. Now, I'm not going to start going through that and doing a code review, but it meant if I come across a feature in the application, I think it might have a vulnerability. 
if I'm doing this black box, I have to start throwing all sorts of different payloads, doing all sorts of permutations, trying to figure out what's going to trigger this vulnerability. If I've got access to the code, I can dig into that function. I start looking at the, how the function works. I figure out exactly what I need to do to exploit it, and then I'm done. I don't have to start throwing mud against the wall, waiting to see what sticks. Ultimately, we're just talking about an improvement process. It's not about an exam. We're not trying to test anyone to see, okay, who knows the most, who can do the most without the least possible information. We just want to build improvement into the application. So this is a bit of a weird concept. Some of you might recognize it. Some of you might think it's absolutely crazy. Um, if you go to your boss and you say, okay, we need to fix this issue. We need to have this security issue. We need to get this fixed because otherwise this will happen. Maybe he'll listen to you. Maybe they'll, they'll listen to you. Maybe they won't listen to you. If you go to your boss with a nice shiny consultant report that says, here's the issue that was found. Here's the risk. Here's the recommendation. You say, look, this is what is in this report. Odds are, depending on the culture of the organization, the boss might say, okay, well, that's come from outside, so that must have come from an expert, or um, so you know, we have to give more weight to that, and that means we're going to be more likely to deal with it. Again, very much depends on the culture of the organization. But if you're in that sort of situation, then you as a person who needs to receive the test can use that to your advantage. Right up front at the scoping stage, you want to be talking to the tester about, okay, these are our concerns, these are issues that I personally, as the maintainer, developer, manager of this application are concerned about and things that I think probably need to appear in the report. And then when they appear in the report, you go to your boss of the report and say, look, I raised these concerns, look, the consultants have raised these concerns as well. And suddenly you're getting more buy-in to get the issues fixed. So that's a way that you can benefit from that. And also the consultant benefits because ultimately they're giving a better picture. Ask from time to time, should we have the same person testing each time? Should we have a new person testing each time? Yes and no. The way I see it, you get benefit from having the same person in testing for a few cycles. The same person is going to understand the application, they've tested it before, they'll understand how it works, you don't have to teach the tester again how the application works, what everything does, what all the different users are, what all the different roles are. And therefore you get some efficiency from that because you don't have to reteach them each time. They can spend more time focusing on the actual testing of that. But hopefully, after a few cycles of doing this testing, suddenly you're, getting, you're seeing less findings, less severe findings, and at that point, maybe you want to get a fresh pair of eyes, maybe a new person from the same organization, maybe a completely fresh person. But someone who hasn't necessarily seen the application before, doesn't know it previously, you're going to have to explain to them again how it works, but again, they may come with a fresh perspective, different ideas, no preconceptions. So you can benefit from both an experienced, an experienced person who's seen the app lots of times and also from a, a fresh person who hasn't seen the application before. So that's something, something to think about. Okay, this here is, I suppose, a very, very sort of minimalist way of how you might see a security test happen. Start off with scoping, understanding what needs to be tested, moving on to a basic overview where the tester discovers, okay, what, what is this application, how am I going to test it, what sort of information do I need, goes on to the testing stage, then a report gets delivered and something happens after that, maybe there's some follow-up, maybe there's a retest, you know, to my mind, this isn't a full project. You want to be aiming for something more comprehensive that covers off a lot more um, considerations and includes a lot more thought. The way I see a full project is more like this, where you start off with the scoping as before, then the developer, sorry, the tester comes in and has a much more in-depth discussion, like I described at the beginning, to understand okay, what it really is going on in this application, how is it built up, what are the different components doing, what's, how's data flowing through the system. We get a much more in-depth understanding. Maybe not a full design review, maybe just a smaller design review. But just to get a better understanding, make sure they're not going in line. Next, do the testing, maybe supported by the source code, like we talked about previously, so that, again, they can test in a more informed way. Then, delivering the report. So already going to be of a higher quality, more comprehensive, be more information in there. Because the tester knew more when he was doing the testing. But that's not the end, and that's where it starts getting important. You want to make sure that there's a formal process where the tester sits down with the internal security team or with the developers and make sure that the findings are fully understood. A lot of times, a company might receive a report, 
understand the most critical elements, not necessarily understand the rest. So it's important to have that stage of making sure that the recipient of the report really understands all the different findings, what the real issue here is, and then moving on to the next stage about actually fixing things. Helping the developers to find a solution. I'll talk more about that later on, but you can use the testers' knowledge to help the developer find out, figure out what exactly needs to be done. And then finally, um, do a retest. Hopefully, if you followed these steps, then almost certainly the findings will be fixed as planned. And then thinking about what's next. Do we want to wait a period of time and then retest? Do we want to test when the next iteration comes out? Do we want to look at a specific aspect of the application? Um, another possibility, which is sort of ex a scope expansion, but I think something worth thinking about. It's based on something called a zero-day card. And that was a guy called Harun came up with that. Uh, I think they did a talk in 2011. The idea here is that testing a web application, fine, testing it as we test a normal web application from the external perspective, and then we say, OK, now, what happens if in this application a zero-day vulnerability is discovered? Suddenly there's a new vulnerability in the application, or more likely in a framework the application is built on, and suddenly the attacker's got access to the web server. It's now sat internally on the network on the web server. What happens then? What access do we have? Now, this is very relevant because a month or so ago we saw Equifax. That's exactly what happened with Equifax. Equifax had their application sitting externally on the internet, and someone discovered a vulnerability in the struts, the framework the application was broken on, attacker broke in, now the attackers sat on the network, so on their internal network, pulling hundreds of millions of records of data out. So it's about saying, okay, we're going to do all this process, but we're also going to have an extra stage. Let's stick our tester on the server, give them remote access to the server. Where do they go from there? Are they blocked off by a DMZ? Are they stuck inside the, the area of the web server, or can they now run around the entire company's internal network? So it's something possibly to add to that, just an additional. Uh, element to consider, especially relevant given the recent Equifax issue. So that's the first five ideas. Let's move on to the next stage now, which is preparation. So maybe this isn't in the immediate run-up to the test, but definitely something to think about. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit, a lot of basic issues that the test doesn't have to report on. If you can catch those early on, even before the tester gets there, then it's going to save the tester time to report these issues and write them up and deliver them over. There are <coughs> scanning tools that exist. OWASP Zap has a web application scanner. It's free. Burp Suite has a web application scanner. It's dirt cheap. You can use those, find basic, simple um, vulnerabilities, get them fixed already before you get to the testing stage. And you can have some fun with it as well if you enjoy trying to break stuff. But on the other hand, it does require some time. Maybe you want the developers to do it, but actually the developers are massively busy. Maybe you want the QA to do it. Maybe you can incorporate it into the CI process. But it does require some time, but you can definitely catch off, pick off some low-hanging fruit, and therefore not have to wait until the security test to get that, get those fixed. So I know plenty of people I've spoken to uh, say their product backlog looks like this. Um, but in that side, that backlog, it may well be you already have known vulnerabilities, known issues. You know that there's this particular security issue. You've had a previous test, or maybe someone mentioned it and it's just gone onto the backlog and hasn't been dealt with yet. If you know those issues exist, tell the tester right at the beginning. Make sure that's clear, front and center, that we know these particular issues exist. You don't want to wait for the tester to go in and start testing the application and independently spend time discovering something that you already knew about and then having to write it up in a report in time that they could be spent doing testing other issues you didn't know about. So you want to push that as early as possible, let them know about that. Um, another thing to think about, you may have areas of the application you're particularly concerned about. We have clients who've said, okay, well, this part of the application was developed ages ago and it's quite old and it may not have all the security controls that uh, are different, that uh, the newer parts of the application have, so maybe take a look over there. There may be areas where you've had to implement something in a non-standard way, maybe you've had to put in a security control in an unusual way or something that's customised or not, uh, not usual. And that might be another area you want to flag up already to test and say, you know, take a look there because there may well be issues there. So 
ultimately it's not a competition who can find this, who can't find this, who found that vulnerability, who didn't find that vulnerability. It's about efficiency, it's about getting the most out of the testing. And the more you tell the test up front, the more they know when they come in to do the test. So I sort of coined this phrase of uh, security by non-testability. So there are lots of great technologies out there that you can stick in front of your application and they make the attacker's life more difficult. Maybe it's uh, a WAF, a web application firewall, that's looking at the content of the request and blocking any that doesn't like the look of it, it looks like they might be malicious. Maybe it's something that blocks automated attacks. Maybe it's some uh, system that randomizes parameter names to make an attacker's life more difficult. These are really great tools, these are really great things that can make an attacker, a real attacker's life much more difficult. But if you're getting a test done, make sure they're disabled. You don't want the attacker, sorry, you don't want the tester going through these tools. You want the tester hitting directly your application. Because otherwise, ultimately, they're testing your security tools, they're not testing your application. If you like, at the end, you can say, OK, here we go, we've got this list of findings. Now, how, what do these findings look like if we now go through the security technology? That's a possibility, but it can also make a mess. Um, we had this a couple of months ago. We had a client where we'd done the test against their application. And they said at the end, OK, can you test this XSS vulnerability via our WAF? Because we want to see whether the WAF can mitigate it. So configured the test via the WAF, prepared the payload, sent the payload to the application, the payload went straight through, succeeded. I went back to the client and said, OK, well, look, it worked. It's, they went back to the WAF vendor. The WAF vendor came back to us and said, oh, yeah, it's, it's a bug in the WAF. It turns out if you put the payload inside an array, inside a JSON, inside another array, inside another JSON within the request, it doesn't find it. But we've fixed that now. We've put up a staging version of the WAF. Here, test via that instead. So it's OK, fine. So sent the same payload via the staging version of the WAF. And the WAF blocked it. So I said, OK, that's great. Now instead of sending one object in this payload, I'm now going to send 100 objects. Much bigger request. Sent that bigger request via the staging version of the WAF. Um, and it went straight through. Hit, it executed, so I went back to the client. I said, look, it's, I made a minor change, it still works. They went back to the WAF end of the WAF end, they came back to us. I said, oh yeah, um, our WAF doesn't look at requests over a certain size. It just ignores it. So, okay. Um, they're like, okay, no, we'll fix that, we'll fix that, we'll fix that. So they fixed it, had the big request, sent it to the WAF, the WAF crashed. The I tried sending more requests. I was just getting 500 errors back. I asked someone in a different office, different IP address, can you try and access via this WAF? They also couldn't access. This wasn't a block, this was a crash. It stayed like that five, 10 minutes. So I went back to the client, explained what happened. They went back to the WAF vendor. The WAF vendor came back and said, yeah, but it blocked the attack. <laughs> so it can lead to more complications. You really want to make sure that you're focusing on fixing the issue in the application itself. And the technologies can help, but you want to be fixing the vulnerabilities in the application. The testing setup, the, the environment we get to test in. So anyone who tells you that their testing will be 100% safe, nothing bad will happen, they're either not telling you the truth or they're, I don't know, bashing the application with a feather or something, barely, barely tapping it. Things happen, even unintentionally, and suddenly it might impact the application. We had a client over the summer where we sent a relatively innocuous, relatively tame piece of JavaScript to the application. It wasn't intended to do anything specific, but it came across a bug in their application and basically brought down the reporting module. This is a multi-user, multi-tenant application, and suddenly every user, every tenant could no longer access the reporting module of this application. Now, luckily, we were testing in QA. Obviously, if that had been in production, that would have been a big issue. Now, again, this wasn't an attack. This wasn't something that was trying to cause an of service. This was a simple piece of JavaScript that just somehow came across a bug in their application. So, because of this, my personal preference, give us a dedicated instance to play with. Let's stand up a dedicated instance based on the code base of the production instance, and let's test on that. Then we're not impacting your customers, we're not impacting your QA staff or anyone else. That's, I suppose, the, the best case scenario. If that's not possible, then let's test on QA, maybe back up the database first, because odds are we're going to make a mess of the database with lots of dummy data. Um, but ideally not on production, just in case. Um, another point here. Let us use our testing laptops. If we can come in, we use our laptops, we've got our environment set up, we've got our tools installed, we've got our workflow set up, then we're going to get there on the first day of the test and start testing. Or even better, we're testing from remotely, 
we get started and we're away for testing. If we have to come in and start sanitizing tools, start installing tools on, co on company hardware, start trying to get admin access so that we can install tools, it, it just takes up a lot of time on the first day of the test and it's, again, not using that time efficiently. Now I know that a lot of, a lot of you may come from organizations where that's just not possible, where external hardware is completely forbidden and that's it. If that's the case, maybe try and have some dedicated machines that are your hardware but have the tools installed, have the, some sort of environment installed to try and speed things up. Uh, the worst case scenario is what I saw a couple of weeks ago, where I came in, big company, do a couple of days of testing. I had to get all the tools sanitized first, get all the tools installed on the first day of the testing. I finish off the test at the end of the second day, tell them I'm finished. They say, yeah, we're, we're going to format the machine now. We're going to wipe the machine now. That's a big company. They're going to have lots of different testing going on. And every single time, someone's going to come in and have to re-sanitize the tools and reinstall the tool tools. Again, you're killing the efficiency at the, the beginning of that test. A little bit, uh, it's something that probably causes the most issues if things aren't ready, if that environment isn't ready. You want to agree up front with the tester with a date, you know, say that this date in two weeks time and three weeks time is when the testing is going to start. You as a recipient want to get from the tester a written list, this is exactly what we need. The tester needs users, the tester needs links, the tester needs specific data. You want to get that information in writing from, that, from them in advance and make sure that's ready by the agreed date, by the agreed due date. Um, and I did test it as well. Again, if we're spending the first day figuring out which users work, which users don't work, and discovering that um, the particular environment doesn't work all the way, some of the modules don't work because uh, there's some sort of error in the deployment, then again, eating up time at the beginning. So being ready is the best way to make sure the testing gets started straight off and straight away with testing full efficiency. Okay, so that is the, uh, the preparation elements. So let's talk about reporting now. Like I say, reporting during the testing, report that comes out at the end of the testing, and what goes on after that. Progress reports. We see requirements sometimes, we want a daily report, we want to hear about findings every single day, we want to hear about progress every single day. I've done a lot of this and this is what I've seen. There are two types of reporting, first of all. There's status reports, i.e. how it's going, what we're doing, and there's findings reports. We found this, we found that. General rule of thumb, the way I've seen it work best, if there's a problem, if there's an issue that's stopping you testing, stopping the tester from testing, you want to hear about that ASAP. Well, I get that escalated immediately because, again, we're reducing the efficiency, we're slowing down the test, we're st stopping the ability of the tester to test efficiently. If there's a critical finding, critical finding means uh, remote code execution on your web server, or suddenly your entire database is exposed, or suddenly a very sensitive operation can be performed by anyone on the internet. If your app is already in production, you want to know about that ASAP as well, because you need to rectify that as soon as possible. Any other findings, leave until later. Even if they're high risk, medium risk, doesn't matter, leave, leave them until later, because ultimately, the findings together are showing a picture of the application at that point in time. And often there may be a finding that on its own would be considered a low-risk finding, but suddenly put together with two or three other findings, and suddenly they're all at much higher risk because together they've created a scenario that's much riskier, that causes much greater vulnerability. So because of that, it's better to wait, because if we're trying to trickle the findings through day by day, you're not going to get that context, you're not going to get that uh, overall oversight as to how the findings relate together. And Potentially, there's going to be corrections that have to be done further down the line. The other issue is that at least the duplication of work. You have to get the finding written up, interrupt testing to get the finding written, then it has to be reviewed, then it has to get sent to the, to the uh, recipient. There may be, have to be refinements to the finding as extra information is discovered, and then finally it has to go into the final report, then the final report has to get reviewed. And it's duplication of effort, again, it's how, we, how we're spending those hours. So, ideally, Problems and critical findings, ASAP. Everything else, let's wait until the end. Let's wait until the report comes out. Having said that, communications during the course of the testing, that's important. Not the formal daily report style communications, but just ongoing discussions between the tester and between the recipients. I came across this. Is that supposed to work that way? Um, 
is that function being used correctly? Should I be able to see that? Does it hurt when I press that? Um, are you seeing that in the logs? That sort of communication is good, and that's important to keep that going informally by email, by phone, but I'm talking here about the, some sort of formalized reporting process. Again, a little bit 101, a little bit basic here, but every report should come with an executive summary. The first few pages of the report say, okay, here's what we did, here's what we found, here's the risk, here's what you need to do about it, in a few pages, in a way that someone non-technical can understand. You want to make sure that looks good. You want to make sure that looks professional. You want to make sure that you, if you choose to, can go and give that to your customers, to your clients, and say, look, we uh, did security testing of our, of our application, and here was a result. Here you can see the, the, the testing results. Um, you also want to make sure that business impact is, is front and center, because whoever's going to be reading this isn't going to be interested in, okay, there's malicious script executing a browser, or there's a HTTP header missing. They want to know data is being stolen, an attacker suddenly inside our network, unauthorized functions are being performed. And that needs to be front and center of the exec summary to make sure that you, know, when you need to take that someone more senior to get approval to fix the issues, that's coming in. And that's coming through. As well as the exec summary, the findings themselves. Detailed enough that the developer or the security team can fully understand, okay, this is exactly what's happened here, this is what needs to be done. Obviously, it needs to be understandable. The recipient of the test needs to be able to understand these. If it's not clear, the tester needs to clarify. Maybe less obviously, it needs to be full information about how to re reproduce the finding. Ideally, you as the recipient should be able to reproduce it so that once you get around to fixing it, you can test internally whether it's actually been fixed. If it's something like a missing header, then maybe it's going to be a very simple example. But I've seen vulnerabilities where there are three, four, five stages to explain, okay, here's exactly what's going on. And that needs to be clearly stated out step by step. Um, so that it's clear to understand. XSS, for example, is an XSS finding. Is that the only finding of XSS in the entire application? Are there no other findings? Are there no other examples of XSS in the application? Are oh, there 20 more, but there's just one demonstrated in the, in the details? But here's a list of the other 20. Or maybe the tester comes back and says, look, we found one example of XSS. We think there might be more, but in the time available, we couldn't find them all. In that last case, you want to push back to the tester and say, okay, well, how can we find other examples? How can we go back to our code base and find other examples of that, that maybe we didn't come across in the test one, that we can then try and pick off from the code side? And ultimately, that, that should be clear for the report. How many instances of this there were, whether this is the only instance, that should be clear there. And again, the recommendations. You don't always want copy and paste recommendations. The recommendations have to consider the specific case. Again, XSS. You fix that in several ways, depending on where, how it appears. You may need to sanitize your output, sorry, encode your output. You may need to change the content type header. You may need to use some sort of input sanitization because you need to keep the HTML code there. You can't just encode it away. And the tester should be aware of which of those is recommendations is appropriate, and that should be what's there. You need to push to make sure that that's clear from the findings that's being written. So this step, I think, maybe gets missed occasionally. Um, you've received the report, the report has risk ratings, well, what now? So you want to get the testers and someone from R&D to sit, sit down together and figure out, okay, how, in what order, what time scales are these going to be fixed? The tester is there presenting on, okay, what's the severity, what's the uh, risk of this issue? The R&D teams are there saying, okay, this is how complicated it is to fix. This is how difficult it is to fix. Maybe it's a very simple one-line change. Maybe the fix requires months of effort or can only be done at a, at a later date. If that's the case where you've got a high-risk issue with a complicated fix, maybe you want to go back to the tester and say, okay, what can we do short-term? What can we do as a, a sticking plaster, as a short-term fix to make sure that that issue gets uh, mitigated at least in the short-term and then in the long-term we can try and fix it properly. Again, push, that, push the tester for that. Push them to say, okay, give us a short term, give us a long term, and then we can add that into the plan of what happens when. Finally, assistance with, um, with the fixes. So the developer is going to know, okay, this is the code base, this is where exactly in the code this issue is, but they may not know exactly what the fix is. On the other hand, 
Does the tester more like to know what the fix needs to be? But they might not need to know where exactly it needs to be done. And you can get value from sitting the developer, sitting the tester down together and figuring out, okay, where exactly, how exactly do we need to fix this? That means that you're reducing the likelihood that it's going to get fixed wrong, reducing the likelihood there's going to be a misunderstanding, um, and overall just making sure that you're not going to end up getting around to the same stage again and having the same finding coming out again. Now, we saw this literally a couple of weeks ago, where a year or so ago, we did a test on an application, CSRF came up, and we reported that, gave them a recommendation. At their request, we then provided a more detailed document that talked through, okay, here's what CSRF is, here is um, how you fix it in different cases, here's how we think you should fix it in your case, taking into account your application, taking into account your frameworks. Then we said, okay, you've got this document, do you want us to sit down with you and talk through, okay, here's a, you know, sit down with the developer and talk through exactly how to do this? And they said, no, 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 it's fine, we, we've got it covered. So we came back to test that application a couple of weeks ago. They'd added a CSRF token to the application. It was now being sent on each sensitive request. But it wasn't being checked at the server side. You could send the wrong token, it would still get accepted. You could send no token, it would still get accepted. So that finding has just gone exactly as it was back again in the report this year. And a lot of time and effort has been wasted, and uh, it's a shame. And hopefully it could have been alleviated if we'd be able to sit together with them and make sure they you know, understood exactly how to fix it. So that's definitely another way of making sure that even at the end of the report, you've got the, the fix within properly. All right, that went by very fast. So here are the 15 ideas. Just talk to them quickly again. Starting from scoping, trying to make sure that anything you can do at the design stage, anything you can do at the um, architect stage, you can do it up front, means that you can uh, cover those things off earlier, that should be easy to fix. Disclosing as much information as possible about how the application works, what's going on behind the scenes. Um, leveraging the report, if you want to get buy-in for a particular issue that you know you have. Using an old hand for a few times, someone who's seen the application a few times, for the first few times of the cycle, and then a fresh start where you get someone new to look at it after the findings start reducing. And having a more comprehensive project, demanding from the testing community, we want something more comprehensive, we want a full cycle of testing here, we don't just want something minimalistic. Going on to preparation, pack yourself first, try and pick off the low hanging fruit yourself. Um, disclosing any known vulnerabilities up front, any known issues, any concerns. Disabling all your fancy security tools, all sort of fancy security technologies that make attackers lives miserable. Um, giving us a dedicated setup, something where if something goes wrong, we're not going to suddenly ruin your customers. And letting us use our own environment to test. And being ready, making sure that everything's ready for the start date of the test. Finally, not too heavy on the progress reporting, critical issues, critical um, things that are blocking a tester, otherwise wait till the end. Executive summary that's clear, looks good, so how it's the business impact. Um, make sure the findings are clear, have good recommendations, show how to reproduce, explain how many instances there are. Prioritize action plan, where we're going to fix this, short term fixes, long term fixes, and finally using the tester to get some assistance and making sure it's the right fix that's done. So that's the, the 15. I suppose I've had some key takeaways. First of all, I've got 15 ideas here. If you can apply one of them, if you can apply two of them, if you can apply five of them, you're going to get incrementally get extra value. It's all going to help. Every little helps here. I've said about a thousand times, I'll say it a thousand more times, efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. I want to maximize those hours. I want to use them as, as best as we possibly can. Finally, building a dialogue. Making sure that there's that discu discussion right from the very beginning between the tester and between the recipients right at the beginning of the scoping stage, all the way through to the stages afterwards, to the uh, after report's been delivered and the follow up. Um, if you've got questions, uh, maybe a couple, a couple minutes now, or contact details here. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Thanks for your time. <laughs>